Greetings, I am Herbert Erpaderp, and today I'm going to build a Land Rover. Not just any Land Rover though. I was sent a conversion kit by Silly's Mini Models to make this Italary 35th scale Land Rover into an Australian or New Zealand fitted for radio variant, which if you ask me is pretty cool. As I understand it, this conversion kit is suitable and has been tested for this Italary kit as well as a Ravel kit. The Italary kit is what I could find, so that's what I'm using. Check the description for a link to Silly's Mini Models, where you can find not only this conversion kit, but also a bunch of others for Land Rovers and various other vehicles. Inside the main kit we find four sprues moulded in a light grey plastic. Not quite as good a colour as the pink sprues in the last Land Rover kit I built, but the important thing is that they're fairly neat and well moulded. There is, as always, a little bit of cleanup required. There's a couple of mould lines here and there, and of course the remains of the sprue gates from clipping the parts out. Beyond that, there shouldn't be too much cleanup or additional work required. The details look pretty good. I'm no Land Roverologist, so I've no idea how accurate these details are. There could be a bolt 2mm to the left of where it should be, and I would never know. The horror. It looks very much like a Land Rover to me though. Accuracy aside, the details do look good and crisp. They're well moulded and I couldn't find any obvious moulding related errors. In addition to the opaque sprues, there is one clear sprue with various windows and headlamp lenses. This is nice and clear, as you would, rightly, expect the clear parts to be. Decals are included, though I don't think they're really suitable for an Australian radio Land Rover. Purchasing some aftermarket decals is almost certainly in order. Fortunately, in 35th scale, aftermarket decals are relatively common, so it shouldn't be too hard to find something suitable. The Italary instruction sheet is pretty much what I would have expected. It's black and white and is the fold-out kind that I'm not the biggest fan of, but the important part, that being the diagrams, are pretty decent. You shouldn't have too much trouble understanding and following them. If Herbert Erpaderp can do it, so can you. The tricky part is using these instructions in conjunction with those for the conversion kit, which isn't hard, you just have to pay a bit more attention. Let's have a look at what's in that conversion kit. Silly's Mini Models is I guess what you would call a cottage industry, so no fancy packaging, and that's not the important thing. These are the important things, and I appreciate that these are all in their own little baggies. It makes things really easy when you're trying to find the part you want, and it also keeps some of those thin bits from getting broken, which they would undoubtedly do if they were to get all caught amongst each other. There are various parts, the names of which I probably don't know, and they've been 3D printed. Some of them, like the wheels, are straight replacements for parts the kit already has, and some of them are additional parts, like the jerry cans, bull bar, and radio antennas. Being that this is a fitted for radio conversion, it's not surprising that there would be antennas. There are also radios, which is also not surprising. You get a selection of radios. If you've been around my channel for a while, you won't be surprised at all when I say that I don't know anything about these radios, but I do appreciate that there are differences between them. If nothing else, it makes things more interesting. You also get some seats, exhausty bits, and tools. All of which are quite nice looking. Some of the parts were a little bit bent, but, and a note was included saying as much, you can heat them up with hot water and gently straighten them out. Nothing too tricky, though do be careful with it. I haven't shown pictures of all the parts, I assume I took pictures but I couldn't find them, and by the time the video is being edited, it's far too late to take new pictures of individual parts. You can see them later as they're added though. The conversion kit comes with instructions, and these are a fairly simple printout. They're relatively easy to understand and follow. Most of the instructions are text, which isn't the worst thing, I can read, but I do find diagrams a bit easier. That's just how my brain works, so I wouldn't say it's really an issue. And in fairness, there are some pictures and they show you where the parts should sit, with the green portion of the image being the base model and the red and orange bits being conversion parts. Let's start gluing some bits of plastic together. First I put together this differential box. It's pretty simple. There are guide pins to help guide the parts together, which is what good guide pins do. I set that aside and add the front leaf springs to the frame. Once you find where they go, they can be pressed into place and friction will hold them reasonably well. You will of course have to glue them if you want them to stay there. At some point I added the differential I put together a moment ago, but I didn't do a very good job of videoing everything I did. 
Then, just behind these lumps that represent engine parts, I glue another lump here. I assume this is or has something to do with the gearbox. Next, I slide the drive shaft through this block. And of course, I am a sensible, mature adult. Just kidding. If you were to build this kit normally, there would also be some exhaust pipe parts involved. We will be adding exhaust pipe parts later as part of the conversion though. There are recesses to guide the mounting of the block thing, whatever you'd call it, and it did need a little pressure, but it wasn't too difficult. Once you get the positioning for that right, it's just a matter of kajiggering the shaft part into the correct place and adding glue. I follow that by gluing the rear differential together, which is very much like the front one. Two parts guided by guide pins. Easy. The rear leaf spring and shock absorber parts go on next. These are conveniently one part for each side. I filmed this a bit better, so you can see I added one leaf spring part, then the differential linking it to both axle and drive shaft, and then kajiggering it together with the second outer part. It was a little bit fiddly to get all the connection points to connect, but not excessively so. Then there's a couple of frame components that go across the bottom of the frame, over or under technically the engine and transmission parts. I then turn my attention to the front, where I attach the shock absorbers, and for whatever reason these are individual parts at the front end. I found the trick was to glue them onto the leaf spring end, and then kajigger the other end onto the frame. I then add the, I don't know what you would call it, the movable wheel rotary front part of the axle. I don't think this kit is meant to have workable steering, though I'm sure if you wanted, you could make it so that it's steering in a direction. I've chosen to have mine driving straight ahead, and I've glued everything in place to reflect that. With the two front wheel holdy bits, there's also a bar that clips into place between them, which will stay there with friction alone, but the glue god would prefer it to be bonded solidly in place. With glue. This other bit of steering rod doodattery is a bit more fiddly to get into place. Editing has made it look like it was quicker and more simple to do than it actually was. I did get it into probably the right place though, or close enough. Next, I add this wall that goes between the engine and driving areas. I guess it's the firewall? It's simple enough to attach, though it's worth paying attention to avoid putting it on at a weird angle. The engine bay part should help you with that. Looking at the side though, I was concerned that maybe the engine bay part wasn't sitting on the frame properly, but that was the best I could get it. I then add the front radiator part of the Land Rover, with the iconic Land Rover badge on it, which you can't really see in these shots. The fit seems to be a bit off, where the top of the fenders and the front part go together. It has a bit of a weird looking gap, but I figured that could be fixed later with some putty or something. And now for the first part of the conversion kit, the wheels. They do look a little bit less crisp than the kit's wheels, but you can see they do have different bolt configurations. I'm going to use the conversion wheels because, well, I assume they're correct. And I certainly don't want people yelling at me in the comments section about incorrect wheel bolts. That would hurt my feelings. So while the wheels aren't as crispy looking as the kit ones are, most tyres that have been used aren't all that crisp looking anyway. They go into place nice and easily in pretty much exactly the spot you would expect wheels to go. Because the 3D print isn't plastic, you'll have to use super glue to bond them into place. Oh no, my cutting mat has changed. Yeah, we know Herbert, it's been in your videos for weeks now. Anyway, the next thing I add is the windshield. And I did my best to get this into the right position, but I don't think it's quite perfect. I did wonder if it might be better to add this at the same time as the doors. Though that would mean having to delay adding the dashboard. Which, as you can probably see, goes over the lower part of the windshield. It is a bit gappy and I'm not sure if I've got it 100% correctly in position, but it's on and it will be inside the vehicle, so it should be kind of hard to see anyway. I then assemble the steering wheel so it'll be bonded together nice and strong by the time I want to install it. And then, foot pedals. Good for pedaling with your feet. These two pedals are one part and there's a little recess under the dashboard they should be glued into. The accelerator goes over here somewhere, though I wasn't sure I'd got it quite in the right place. Again, this won't be especially visible once the entire model is together, so I wasn't overly concerned with it. I then install the various gear sticks and handbrake levers, as well as what I think is a fire extinguisher just forward of those. All of this stuff is quite small and fiddly, so you'll probably find tweezers to be helpful. 
If you'd like a discount on tweezers like the ones I'm using from Nine Steps Industries, check the description for a link and use code HERBERT20 for 20% off. Now it's time to add that steering wheel that I glued together all those years ago. It's fairly simple to get into place, as are the seats, but this video has been running for a while so it's time for the first mistake. As far as mistakes go this one is pretty minor, and it was obvious enough that I saw it right away and was able to fix it easily. Now that all the seats are in the correct positions, it's time for some modification. You need to make a hole on the left front side part, and this is part of the regular kit build. We'll stick something in there later. Then as part of the conversion, I clip the lower section off the side fender bits. This is pretty simple, and there's a convenient line showing where to cut. I didn't show myself doing it, but I sanded the bottom to make it look a bit neater. Then this, whatever it is, goes into the hole I just drilled in the left fender. Why not attach those fender parts to the vehicle? These aren't hard to get into place, though there's not really any strong keying for them. I don't think I've got them on perfectly, and they might need a bit of putty work in places, but they look reasonable enough. Maybe we can say this Land Rover has been roughed up a little bit. It is a war vehicle, so it makes sense. The doors go on next and it's pretty easy to figure out how these go on. The hinge part acts as a guide quite well. It does still leave a bit of play in the parts, but nothing too bad. You could, if you want, model these open, though there doesn't seem to be a lot of detail on the inside of the doors. They might look kind of interesting if they were slightly ajar or something. It might also help disguise any alignment issues that come up when you try to add the window parts, which is what happened in my build. Nothing too serious, and I'm sure with a good amount of kajiggering they could be made to look a lot better. Again, maybe this Land Rover's been roughed up a bit and the panels aren't perfectly aligned anymore. There is also clear window glazing that should go in here, and obviously I've left that off to make painting easier. I'm hoping it won't be too difficult to insert the clear parts later, but I guess that's something for future Herbert to worry about. Present Herbert is concerned with adding this little wall part. It's not too difficult, and there's nothing to really worry about other than getting it lined up properly. Then the bottom of the rear tray part goes into place. There's a couple of guide pins on the bottom of this which is helpful. At the front, to hide the fact that the Land Rover has no engine at all, I attach the bonnet, or hood if you're an American. There's guide pins here too. It would be really easy to get this misaligned without them. I follow this with the front bumper, which also has some helpful guides so you don't mount it off center. Then I use probably a bit too much super glue to attach the spare wheel to the bonnet, which has a fairly obvious mounting position. The exhaust comes next, and this is significantly different to the kit's exhaust. It mounts on the front instead of running along the frame to the rear. It did take a bit of kajiggering and fiddling to get it around all the rods and stuff under the front end here, but eventually I figured it out. Unsurprisingly, there's also a rear bumper, so that may as well be installed too. It does have a particular way it should go on, so don't put it on upside down. Now it's time to clip more bits off body panels. As before, you simply cut along the line moulded in the part. Why not then glue those parts onto the vehicle? There are guides for this, but there is still a bit of play to it, so you might have to do a little bit of nudging. It may be that I had something positioned incorrectly, but I found it a little bit tricky to get the sides, particularly the left, to line up with the doors. I did manage to get them on reasonably neatly, but I think we're still sticking to the story that this Land Rover has been roughed up a bit. Maybe it did a few too many sick jumps. The tailgate comes next, and this is another conversion part. You can tell by how it is. I had to sand these to get them to fit properly, especially the one on the right side. I wouldn't say that's really an issue, but it is a good reminder that test fitting parts, conversion parts or kit parts, is a good idea. The central part of the tailgate goes in next, and it is quite a tight fit. I don't know anything about Land Rovers really, other than they rove the land, everyone knows that, but what I'm trying to say is I'm not sure if this entire tailgate is actually meant to be solid, but it does have a convenient cutout for climbing in and out of. I follow that with a fuel filling thingamajig. There's nothing to guide this horizontally, so you've just got to look at the picture included with the instructions and kind of eyeball it. Now we need a place for the fuel to go, but first I cut some nubbins off. There was no instruction to do so, but they didn't seem like they should be there, and they wouldn't be visible if the lower sections of the body panels were still in place. 
Then I glue the fuel tank into place which is quite easy. You just need to apply some pressure while the super glue bonds. I'm sure most of us can do that. I probably should have sanded the top of this part to get it a bit more flat. There is a tiny gap at some points, though you can't tell from most angles, so I'm not really worried about it. The conversion kit has tools which mount on the front fenders, so I add those now. The default tools go on the tailgate which has obviously been replaced. They would just get in the way with the current tailgate. There are no mounting points for these tools, but they're pretty easy to install anyway. You just have to eyeball them a bit. There's a pair of jerry cans that mount on the rear bumper. You do also get the option of the little mounting things without the jerry cans, but the jerry cans do look really good, especially the little straps, and so of course I wanted to use those parts. I follow that with a pair of what I understand to be a pair of ventilated battery covers. There's a little lip along the bottom of these parts, so you really only have to worry about the horizontal positioning. Into the rear section I glue this seat. It's very seat. It is a fairly tight fit there, so you may need to sand the sides down a bit, but that shouldn't be too much of a challenge. To the left of that I add this power switch. It was easiest to just kind of slide this along the raised side bit there, and I'm not sure if that's the correct height for it or not, but that's where it is. In the rear there's a couple of folded up seats, and they pretty much drop right into place, though do make sure that they're not sitting at a weird angle. If the top of these were to lean out too far, I could see them interfering with the canopy later on. Then tables, or benches or whatever you want to call them. Things to hold the radios. These seem like they should be roughly flush with the top of the side walls here. I probably don't need to explain why these go into place after the folded up seats. Do it anyway! No. As I said, the tables are for radios, so I add those next. One of the spaces is occupied by this flat thing, which I assume is some sort of radio holder, so we've got three radio sets. I don't know what kind of radios these are. Their names are mentioned in the instructions, but I have no idea which is which. I just picked a random combination of radios. This is the internet, so surely nobody would get all butt mad about that. Anyway, the radios are easy to position, and I think they look great. They're very well detailed. Then this thing, I'm not sure what you would call it, but it goes on the front bumper. You can see this had a slight curve to it, so I dealt with that by gluing one end on, letting it bond, and then gluing the other end down. The bull bar will mount onto this, so it does need to be centred. There are no guides for it, but I use the frame parts behind the bumper as a sort of visual guide, so it might not be perfectly centred, but it's close enough. And now, antenna mounts. I wasn't exactly sure how these should be mounted, but I think I've done it correctly. They will interfere with the kit's canopy, but I don't think they should be mounted any lower. The four antenna mounts correspond with the four radio positions. Oh really? Yes. So if you have a space with no radio like I do, you'd put the empty antenna mount nearest that position. I add the bull bar next, and this pretty much just dropped right into place. I was a bit worried because this is such a thin, easily broken part. So far I haven't broken it though, so that's nice. Obviously I haven't installed the clear headlight parts yet, but they shouldn't be too difficult to put in through the bull bar once it's time. Here's the canopy I mentioned before. This part should sit fairly low over the side here, and the antenna mounts clearly interfere with that. The only solution I could think of was to cut slots out to clear the antenna mounts, and I do this carefully with quite a bit of test fitting. It is a little bit of effort, but it wasn't the most difficult thing. Despite its name, superglue is feeble and weak, so be careful not to knock the antenna mounts off while test fitting. What did I just say? The cuts I've made are fairly rough, but they don't need to be perfect, or even neat. My plan is to putty over them as though the fabric of the canopy sides is stretched over the mounts, resulting in a slight bulge. That can't be done until after the interior gets painted and the canopy is glued down, and it isn't painting time yet, so that's going to have to wait. I also cut out a small recess to clear the fuel cap. Then I glue the canopy sides onto the roof. I use the back piece to help get the side parts at something close to the correct angle. It's obviously a good idea to keep test fitting this and make any adjustments to the cutouts. As I just said, the interior does need painting, so I don't glue this into place yet. It will need some pressure to eliminate gaps, 
but it does fit. I could use the canopy rear from the base kit, but it will not only need a bit of modification, but it will also impede visibility into the radio area, so I'll have to make my own canopy rear. Before that though, I add the rest of the kit parts. This towing hook, which I think I've installed correctly, and the side mirrors, which very easily mount into the little holes on the sides of the doors. You may need to give them a bit of a nudge, but they pretty much just plop right into place. Now that that's done, here's how I made a rolled up flap for the rear of the canopy. I did do a fairly poor job of videoing it, but I did video some. I flattened out a piece of green stuff and cut it to roughly the size of the rear canopy part from the kit. I then attached it to the back of the canopy and rolled it up, pretty much like you might do with the real thing. I don't think I did the best job of that, and it does look a little bit thick, and overall probably a little bit bigger than it really should be, but it does the job. I also sculpted some depressions into it where the straps would go. I am definitely not a great or even good sculptor, but this is pretty simple to do. Then in absence of anything better, I used some thin styrene rod as straps. I glued those in at the bottom first, and gradually bent them around to the roof. There's a couple of nubs there which I assume is mounting points for straps. I also added a couple of bits of this rod horizontally on the inside as reinforcement, but again, I did a bad job of videoing what I did here. I think you get the idea though. I'm not super happy with how the straps look. I think they're a bit too thin, but changes can always be made. I'm thinking I might either pick up some wider flat styrene, or maybe just use a bit of green stuff. I obviously haven't done that yet, and I just wanted to get this video finished and out. It has been almost done for a long time. So that's the Australian and New Zealand Land Rover fitted for radio conversion from Silly's Mini Models built on the Italeri Land Rover in 35th scale completed. Mostly completed anyway. As I mentioned, I will be doing some putty work along the sides of the canopy, and probably in a couple of other places, and the rear flap might need some reworking, and the canopy itself has obviously been left unglued to allow for painting, same as the window glazings, but it's mostly done for now, and I'm rather happy with it. This vehicle isn't really something within my main area of interest, that being World War II armour, though it is admittedly pretty close. It's still something I normally wouldn't have picked myself, so I appreciate Silly's Mini Models for not only sending me this kit free of charge, I mean who doesn't like receiving nice things, but also for, well, not forcing me, but I guess kind of nudging me in a direction to do something a bit different, and now I've got an interesting and relatively unique model. Conversion kits like this are a great way to have a model of something that's less commonly available, and that's always cool. I really like the way the radios in the back of this look. I did consider completely leaving the canopy off, and I still might do that. With the canopy not yet glued down, that is still an option. I have no idea how these Land Rovers were used, but I assume with the electronic gear in the back, they'd probably mostly keep it covered up. I am also considering trying to add a small light in the radio area, just to make things a bit more visible in there. I've no idea how realistic it would be to have a light in the back, I mean, they'd probably have some illumination, right? I'm not overly concerned about being hyper-realistic anyway, and it is only an idea that I'm considering. I know some people can't tell the difference between considering and absolutely going to do, so I'll say that it's not super likely that I'll actually do it, but it is a nice idea. Anyway, I quite enjoyed this build. There were some fiddly bits, both in the main kit and the conversion kit, but nothing too difficult to overcome, and nothing to ruin my enjoyment. If you're interested in doing this conversion, or one like it, check out Silly's Mini Models. There's a link in the description. If anybody else runs a small business like this, and you would like me to build one of your models, I'm always happy to do so. I have my PO box listed below if anybody wants to send me things. Okay, so before I start waffling too much, I do plan to paint this relatively soon. I mean, not like next week or next month, my painting queue is still quite full and a bit neglected, so I wouldn't go holding your breath for it or anything like that, but I do feel like this is going to look cool when it's painted and I'm pretty keen to do so. If you have any questions or comments, put them in the comments section below. If you want to watch me build kits like this one live, check out my Twitch channel, where I stream pretty much all of the builds you see on this channel. Subscribe and click the bell if you want to see more, and if you want, you can see my videos a bit early while helping to support the channel over on Patreon or Coffee. 
You can find links to those and all my other things like Discord and social media in the description below. Take care of yourselves, be excellent to each other, and thanks for watching. Farewell.